All right. Uh, well, thank you, Kyle. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the Ottawa chapter for your interest and support. Um, thanks as well to all those who have uh, joined us here this evening. Um, so I'm going to jump right into this and I'll start with probably the most boring part. And that's a little bit of background on myself and uh, how I came to be interested in this topic. Uh, I guess first and foremost, I'd point to my, uh, to my late father, who uh, was a family genealogist and historian. And he introduced me to, uh, to archival research and archives back in the 70s. And I was equally inspired by my grandfather, who served in the First World War in the uh, Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve, and my two great uncles, who uh, served in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment in the First World War. So it's fair to say that I was uh, exposed to, to history and military history at a, at a young age. But my interest in aviation in particular, uh, that started when my family moved to Gander about uh, 40, a little over 40 years ago. And I wasn't long there and I was in high school at the time and uh, a couple of high school friends told me about this uh, B-17 crash near the Trans-Canada Highway. So of course, being curious teens, we hopped on our bicycles and pedaled down there and hiked through the woods to, to explore the site. So I was pretty much uh, hooked in and my curiosity led me to uh, recording other crash sites around Gander, uh, documenting these sites, uh, dates and serial numbers and accident reports and so on. And eventually that expanded to include uh, crash sites in all of Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, that interest expanded to include uh, Air Force operations at, at Gander, especially at Gander, but not just, just exclusively Gander. I was interested in operations at Goose Bay, uh, the American field at Harriman, uh, Argentia and Torbay, uh, present day St. John's International Airport. And uh, so as for, uh, and of course my interest was not just Ferry Command, I was interested in American operations and RCAF operations as well. As for the inspiration for my, for my book, uh, what I did come to determine during the course of my research with Ferry Command, I was really intrigued by the level of effort that they put into salvaging aircraft. And that's not to say that the Americans or Canadians didn't, but there was just something about Ferry Command. They, they always seemed to go that extra mile when it came to salvaging aircraft. And my initial intention was to, was to tell a story more or less about the mishaps and salvage efforts. But it became clear that the story wouldn't be complete unless I got into a lot more context and history of Gander, uh, the wireless and signal section, and uh, the air traffic control units and some of the social aspects on the base as well. So the end result, I guess I would consider to be more of a, a narrative history. Uh, there was no thesis or argument as such, but there was one objective that I had, and that was to try to determine uh, the number of aircraft that were ferried through Gander. Because Ferry Command delivered approximately, say, 10,000 aircraft during the war. And I wanted to determine what percentage of those went through Gander, because there's sort of a local myth with all due respect to my Gander friends, that Ferry Command delivered 10,000 aircraft and all 10,000 10, of them were flown through Gander, which of course is not, not the case. Um, so anyway, just a couple of acknowledgements. First, I wanted to thank Sean, Sean Gilmore and his, he's the son of Joe Gilmore, one of the key characters in my book. And Sean was instrumental in providing photographs and anecdotes about his father and some personal anecdotes about uh, growing up. He was, just a, he was just a boy at the time, but he provided some really neat stories about what it was like to grow up uh, at Gander during wartime. Also the staff at the Directorate of History and Heritage and Matthias uh, in particular, I was quickly responded to my many, many uh, endless emails uh, looking for crew assignment cards and so on. And of course my, <clears throat> my friend and editor and I guess personal brain trust, and that would be Diana Trafford who's here as well. Uh, Diana done tremendous work and without her, I could not have, you know, I, this book would not have been completed. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> And there are many others deserving of thanks as well, and they're noted in the book. Um, some of you may have read the book, and I, I thank you for that. So some of this may seem a little repetitive. Uh, I'm sort of going to give an over, you know, sort of an overview of the uh, of the Gander unit here. And I guess I'm going to make some sort of assumption here that most of you are aware of um, the various name changes that the ferry service went through. Sort of starts as the Canadian Pacific Railway uh, Railways Air Service Department and then the Atlantic Ferry Organization and then Ferry Command and then eventually uh, RAF Transport Command. But I'll refer to it mostly as the Ferry Service or Ferry Command just to avoid any any confusion. So I'll just start with just a little bit of uh, context here on Gander itself. Uh, for those who don't know too much about the history. Uh, 
and the evolution of the of the airfield. And just to be clear too, that Gander wasn't built because of the war. Uh, construction actually began in the mid 1930s, and this is a time when aircraft technology is bringing commercial transatlantic aviation closer to reality. And there's interest spreading among European nations. So the British Commonwealth, they, they're compelled to decide, well, what, what role do we wish to play and to make plans for the future? And of course, those plans are going to include Newfoundland due to its location on the proposed air routes. Of course, Newfoundland being on the Great Circle route. Uh, then in 1935, there's the Ottawa Conference. And at the Ottawa Conference, Newfoundland, the Irish Free State, Canada, and the UK all agree to cooperate to establish a regular transatlantic service, first carrying mail and then eventually passengers. So this immediately sets in motion aerial and ground surveys in Newfoundland. But the first phase as agreed at this 1935 conference uh, involves uh, experimental flights using flying boats operated by the British carrier Imperial Airways. And for this purpose, the seaport town of Botwood is selected, Botwood, Newfoundland, not very far from Gander actually. Um, but for the anticipated land plane service, uh, a site is selected not far from Botwood on the shores of Gander Lake and adjacent to the Newfoundland Railway. And construction or groundwork is, is started uh, in 1936. Uh, and at the, during construction, it wasn't called Gander, it was called the Newfoundland Airport. It was only several years later that, uh, that it assumed the name Gander, but initially it was just called the Newfoundland Airport, pretty generic. Uh, in 1938, January 38, uh, the first landing there is made by Captain Douglas Fraser, Newfoundland-born Captain Douglas Fraser, and a member of the Canadian Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, he lands uh, in a Foxmouth, B-O-A-D-E, a government, Newfoundland government-owned Foxmouth. And as I said, he is the, uh, the first aircraft to land at the airport. The runways are not yet complete, and he lands, and it's a ski-equipped Foxmouth. Uh, so by 1939, the key infrastructure includes four paved runways, an administration building, which is in the top photo here. That's the administration building. For all intents and purposes, that was the air terminal. Uh, there's control towers on top. And inside, there were accommodations for staff and some of the wireless, uh, the wireless section as well. There was a, a lounge or bar in there as well uh, that I think the was referred to uh, by one of the uh, uh, law enforcement people at the time as, a, as an evil influence. Uh, also, there was one hangar built and that's the hangar at the bottom of the, uh, the bottom photograph there. Uh, so that was just the basically called a civil hangar. Later on, it was given a number, it was considered hangar number 20, but at the time it was just the, the civil hangar, said to be one of the largest hangars in the world as well. Uh, there were wireless receiving and transmitting stations as well, roughly north and south of the airfield. And these were operated by the British Air Ministry. But the aerial activity just prior to the war was very limited. Uh, there was mid-air refueling trials and they used Hanley Page Harrow tankers. And these trials were carried out in conjunction with the work that Imperial Airways was doing at, Bat at Botwood. Um, other than that, there was also upper air meteorological data collection flights, and they were done using the aforementioned Foxmoth, the OADE, and the arrival of a couple of visitors from the United States. So it was very limited uh, activity there prior to World War II. And speaking of the visitors, one of those visitors who came from the United States was a gentleman by the name of Charles Backman. And he was on a risky venture to deliver his aircraft to his native Sweden. Uh, and he became the first to depart the airfield on a transatlantic flight. Uh, and he was never heard from again. So there's even less activity in the months after war broke out in 1939. And indeed the airfield's future was very much in question. Of course, this brings us to 1940. And at this time, the Newfoundland governor is complaining to the British Dominions office that Newfoundland is largely undefended. It was pretty much completely undefended in 1940. And the UK responds by allowing Canada to send a detachment of RCAF Douglas Digby patrol bombers to Gander in June of 1940. And this is basically the only aerial activity at Gander uh, until later in 1940 when the air ferry service arrives on the scene. So prior to the creation of the Air Ferry Service, as some of you may know, these American-made aircraft were 
uh, ship uh, to the UK by sea. So they had to be dismantled and reassembled on arrival. And of course, all this created considerable delays. And there had to be another solution. And, and as some of you know, I'm sure, is Lord Beaverbrook, the British Minister of Aircraft Production, well, he spearheaded this scheme to instead fly the aircraft overseas. And of course, Gander is the logical starting point due to its easternmost location in North America. So we see in November, December of 1940, there are four experimental delivery flights and a total of 25 Hudson bombers are safely delivered overseas. And uh, the photos, the center photo here is, uh, that would be Gander in the summer of 1941. You can see the Hudson bombers here in front of the civil hangar. Uh, the photos on the left and right are of the second delivery flight in late November, 1940. Uh, I'm sort of surprised to come across those photos. I've never seen photos of the early delivery flights. Uh, so this would have been late November. Obviously they had a lot of snow that year. Um, and of course the success of these flights ushers in a new and quicker method of transatlantic aircraft delivery. Uh, there was however, one serious mishap during the early flights, which I will uh, touch on later. And as I mentioned, um, there were four, four, four early experimental formation flights of seven aircraft. So that would be 28 aircraft, but 25 is what was delivered. So what happened to the other three? Well, one of them was involved in an accident, uh, again, which I'll discuss briefly later. Uh, one returned due to engine trouble and one didn't take off at all. So I guess the question now is what did the successful flights of November, December, 1940 mean for Gander moving forward? Well, simply put, it would meant more ferry flights, but the challenge for Gander now was its limitations in terms of accommodations and hangar space. They did have an inn uh, it was built by the Canadian Pacific Railway and, and, and that opened late in 1940, in December 1940, just when they started those experimental flights, they did, uh, they did build an inn, which they called appropriately the Eastbound Inn. Uh, and of course, there was that, uh, that one hangar. The problem now, of course, is that where the Canadians were also in Gander, they were sharing that hangar with the, uh, with, with the uh, ferry service, so very limited space. So the ferry serv service determined that it needed two hangars uh, and its own accommodations. And for this, a site was selected on the east side of the airfield and construction began uh, roughly in early, early 1941. And by late 1941, uh, most of the key buildings were completed and the staff began to move over from the administration building, I showed you earlier, which was basically the terminal, uh, and the eastbound inn, because some of the uh, some of the workers had their offices set up in this in this particular inn. And uh, they late forty one, they start to move over. And the photo there is the photo would be uh, taken in the immediate post war uh, period, but uh, it it definitely gives a a very good overview of the ferry command side. And the facilities there are very basic. Uh, the two hangars you see there, hangars they become hangars twenty one and twenty two. Uh, there's barracks behind those are barracks buildings. There are barracks A, B, and C. And there's a mess hall there. The commanding officer's residence is there. Uh, there's a water tower. And later there's a building for the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the RAF Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Um, so again, it's, it's a very you know, basic setup. You do see on the picture there in the far left, uh, there's a control tower there. Uh, that uh, that was opened in uh, February of 1944. So up until then, they used the uh, the control tower in the administration building, and they they built a new one there, which was operated throughout the war by the RCAF. Also, it's not in this photograph, but a little to the right uh, in the woods, uh, the commanding officer uh, he established a piggery. Uh, so the RAF had their own piggery there. But they had to find someone to run that piggery. And uh, so the commanding officer approached a gentleman in St. John's here who was a who had his own pig farm. And that gentleman was named Joseph R. Smallwood. And as some of you may know, he, uh, of course, in 1949, led Newfoundland into Confederation. Uh, but uh, during the war, he was a pig farmer. So uh, Next photo is, I mentioned the commanding officer, commanding officer had a residence there as well. This was the commanding officer's residence and because of its, uh, its structure, it was nicknamed the barn. And it was here that the, uh, that the commanding officer hosted various dignitaries from Charles de Gaulle to 
numerous American generals, politicians, uh, and VIPs. The uh, the unit diary lists every time someone comes in. There was an amazing assortment of individuals past through Gander during the war, and were hosted uh, and stayed there overnight in uh, the CO's residence. So once the uh, the ferry command side was completed, it was given the name Beaverbrook Center or Beaver Center for short, of course, after Lord Beaverbrook. A couple of changes of note in 1941, besides the completion of Beaver Center, uh, the RCAF assumed control of the airfield from Newfoundland for the duration of the war. Of course, the, air, the airfield up until April of 41, the airfield was still owned by and controlled by the Newfoundland government, but they really had no use for it. Uh, so they turned control over to the RCAF. And the, only, the other thing in 41 is that I mentioned that the wireless section was run by the Air Ministry, but Ferry Command took over the wireless section in 1941 as well. But although the RCAF controlled Gander, um, the airfield, Beaver Center and Ferry Command was, they were given a certain degree of autonomy when it came to uh, the development of you know, buildings and works. Although uh, I think what you see there in the picture, what was completed in 1941, there really wasn't much expansion beyond that. But they were given you know, that, that degree of autonomy if they wanted to, to, to uh, within reason anyway, they would have to, uh, the agreement was that they would have to notify the RCAF who would notify the Newfoundland government because for all intents and purposes, uh, the RCAF were just running the airport for the duration of the war. So if there were any major construction projects, the Newfoundland government did want to, uh, want to be notified. Just to touch on some of the key unit personnel at Gander with the Ferry Command Unit. They were a mix of civilian and service personnel. One of the uh, one of the gentlemen that I spoke with, uh, who worked with the unit for the duration of the war, he suggested to me that about eighty percent of the staff were civilian. I'm not sure how accurate that figure is, but uh, uh, the aircraft maintenance section, which I focus on fairly extensively in my book, was exclusively civilian, and the men came from various parts of Canada and eventually from Newfoundland and Labrador as well. So one of my key characters is Joe Gilmore, and this is Joe Gilmore in the photograph. And he was born in East Belfast, and he served in the Irish Army Air Corps. And in 1933, he made his country's first parachute descent. Then he was hired by Imperial Airways as an aircraft engineer. And he helped also helped set up the flying boat bases at uh, Botwood and at uh, Boucherville, Quebec. And Imperial then transferred him to the ferry service in 1940, where at St. Hubert near Montreal, he helped prepare uh, those, those Hudsons uh, for that flight in November, December of 1940. Then in 41, he was sent to Gander as the chief maintenance engineer. And he ultimately became much respected by his staff and well known in rural Newfoundland for his uh, medevac flights and salvage operations. Now here's someone you may know, uh, some of you will know, and that's uh, Newfoundlander Tom McGraw. And uh, he was an early arrivee at Gander, and he was the airport operations officer uh, before the first ferry flights and before the RCAF took over the airfield. And he was taken on by Ferry Command in December of 1941, certainly because of his unique understanding of uh, ferry service uh, transatlantic operations. And in time, he became the senior flying control officer at the Gander unit with the transatlantic air traffic control unit. So he, along with a number of other civilian staff in supervisory positions, were given special commissions. They were called civilian component commissions. And uh, this allowed them to carry out their duties at as uniform members of the, uh, of the RAF. And initially McGraw, when he joined the RAF was given the rank of flight lieutenant and later uh, squadron leader. And this gentleman here is uh, a Newfoundland born John Murphy. And uh, I conversed and corresponded with John quite, quite a bit. Uh, and we would get together every now and then for a cup of coffee when he visited us, uh, visited here from his uh, retirement home in Arizona. And he went to Gander in early 1941 and he was as a teenager actually, and he was uh, hired immediately by the ferry service as a confidential secretary to the uh, 
to the ferry services manager at Gander. And ultimately he stayed on to Gander, uh, stayed on in Gander until, uh, until the end of the war, until the unit closed out. Uh, and throughout that period, he was the confidential secretary to all the base uh, unit managers and commanding officers. Of note, I'll, uh, as well, a key individual, Frank Ratcliffe, the head of signals at the wireless section and the chief meteorologist, of course, the famous Patrick McTaggart Cowan. Uh, as well, in the early days of the ferry service, uh, there were a couple of civilian station superintendents, and one of those uh, was a Canadian and pre-war bush pilot, Captain Ian Ross. Now, in 1941, the ferry service was taken over by the RAF to become RAF Ferry Command. And of course, that, that change in managerial structure saw the arrival of, a, of RAF officers to command the unit. And in particular was uh, Group Captain David Anderson. And he uh, transpired that he became the longest serving commander of the unit. And I'll talk a little bit about, a little more about uh, Group Captain Anderson later. Just for some context here. So this would be Gander Airfield in roughly 1943, 44. Uh, you see the Fury Command sector there. Obviously it's all straightforward labeled. Uh, pretty compact compared to the, uh, the other sectors. Uh, the RCAF sector just to the right of that was actually the Canadian Army side. And then there was the American sector for uh, US ferry operations. And of course, you can see that the American sector was significantly larger than, than, the, than the ferry command sector. Uh, in the sort of center left, you can see a lot of aircraft lying in the runways and they're all B-17s and B-24s. And that's all in connection with uh, US ferrying operations. So if anybody's flown through Gander, uh, so where you see the USAF sector there, they had about a dozen hangars. That's where the present day terminal is to and parking area, CFB Gander and uh, 103 Search and Rescue Squadron, uh, the old former USAF side. The only other thing I'll point out before I forget, when you look at the Ferry Command side, uh, the two Ferry Command hangars, 21 and 22, they are the only two original World War II hangars still standing at Gander. And hopefully they stand for a lot longer. And presently they're used by government air services for their, uh, their CL-215 water bombers. I'm well, just gonna to touch on the joint control aspect in Gander, speaking of US ferrying operations, because when the US entered the war in 1941, there's a major increase in deliveries through Gander because the US is beginning to build up its air units in the UK, the eighth, it's what becomes the eighth air force. So the first major movement of U.S. Air aircraft under what's called the Bolero Plan, uh, they start using Gander in the fall of 42. They do ferry aircraft under that plan before then, but they fly through Goose Bay. But the first to go through Gander begins in the fall of 42. And the U.S. anticipates even more delivery flights in 1943. So this comes with some concerns. Because what we have now are two ferrying organizations, the, uh, the US and the RAF, uh, both using the Atlantic routes. Uh, so coordination and cooperation becomes paramount with, especially with transatlantic uh, air traffic control. So the end result after a series of meetings between representatives of Ferry Command and the US Ferrying Service, uh, and after on-site vi on visits at Gander and Goose Bay and Greenland and so on, the officials agree to establish joint US RAF transatlantic control centers to coordinate the delivery of aircraft. And the photo here is of the Gander Center. Uh, it's, a, it's the only photo I've ever found of the, of the joint control center at Gander uh, taken during the war. Uh, it's pretty poor quality. So, but at Gander, the, uh, the Ferry Command Hangar number 21 was remodeled to accommodate this joint control center with a large movements board, as you can see in the background. And it's occupied by RAF and US air traffic controllers. They sit side by side and they guide these aircraft eastbound until they're taken over by their counterparts in, uh, in Presswick. Um, so the, the photo, the, the gentleman in the foreground is a, again, is a, a mixed group because they're uh, US and RAF controllers in the foreground. In the background, you see a gentleman on the ladder and a man standing next to him, and they are actually Newfoundland, uh, Newfoundland civilian workers 
and they're they're working the movements board. So it's a real, as I as I mentioned, a real mix of civilian and service personnel. So as part of the remodeling uh, of the hangar, the signals uh, or wireless section also is moved to hangar 21. And they're given remote access to the radio receiving and transmitting sites from within the hangar. And among the wireless staff are female civilian Morse code operators. And they, uh, along with members of the RAF's Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and they handle coded messages from Dorval, Prestwick, New York, and Foynes in Ireland. Just to touch on some of the stories that I address in my, uh, in my book, as I mentioned, I, my interests began with some of the uh, crash sites around Gander. Uh, first photo here is Hudson T9446. And uh, this was, I mentioned earlier, this was the ferry service's first major accident at Gander. And it occurred in uh, late December, 1940, during the fourth and final, final uh, formation flight. And the uh, Hudson crashed on takeoff and burned out. And the crew were lucky to escape, to, escape, to say the least. Incidentally, the first officer uh, was Arthur Bruce Watt, who was the uncle of Diana Trafford. Uh, and it was through this incident that we connected uh, several years ago. This is Hudson FH-235, force landed in Western Newfoundland in March of 42. And it's sort of a good example of the efforts uh, made to salvage aircraft and community involvement. Uh, so the, the engines were removed and the wings were removed and, and brought out by, uh, I think, horse-drawn horse sleighs. And then they, they hired community members uh, to, uh, to help them drag the, uh, drag the aircraft from the hillside. And they dragged the aircraft to the community uh, of Codroy. And from Codroy, it was floated out to a ship and returned to Montreal. Again, just a, a, an indication of the uh, level of effort that was put into salvaging these aircraft. This is a, a, a Ferry Command uh, Ventura AJ-471. The force landed in November of 42, um, just east of Gander. Uh, the crew was rescued, uh, a PBY landed on a nearby lake, they walked over land, uh, the rescue team did and, and brought the crew out, except for the pilot and one of the passengers. The pilot and one of the passengers decided they, they were going to walk the Gander, and it took them 16 hours through the, through the woods in November before they finally made it to Gander, soaking wet and exhausted. And I, I flew in there a few years ago, and that's when I took that picture. Uh, sadly, the aircraft was relatively intact up on, uh, you know, certainly about 25, 30 years ago. And someone went in and cut it up for scrap metal uh, before they, uh, someone intervened and told them that, no, no, you can't do that. So we, uh, we've been, uh, a few years ago, we've been working on trying to uh, get the wreckage uh, removed. So we're gonna, that was the attempt that day was to try to get a helicopter to sling it out, but uh, it didn't go as planned. We, uh, we did salvage some parts and got them stored at the, at the airport in Gander behind the fence. Next photo is, this is a Boston BZ-294. Again, this aircraft crashed on approach in December of 42 with the loss of two crewmen and uh, there was one survivor. It's kind of hard, like you could see the two engines there. And I believe what you see there is a, uh, uh, the long range uh, fuel tanks that were installed. Uh, but if anybody, uh, I've always been, I've been in, this is a picture I took some years ago and uh, maybe 12 or 14 years ago. And I was sort of confused. So if anybody has anything to add about, about that, about what they see there, I'm, I, I'm all ears and I'd be happy to, to email you to photograph if you can identify uh, what I'm looking at here. Uh, this is a fairly well-known crash, the uh, uh, Liberator AL591 that crashed in February of 43 while trying to land at Gander. The, uh, the air was in poor weather and the aircraft circled the airfield several times and ran out of fuel and quite literally dropped from the sky. And this was the return ferry service Liberator. As some of you may be aware, they established the return ferry service as a, as a quick means of transportation to get air crews back from the UK and back to Montreal for further assignments, as opposed to bringing them back by sea, which was going to take a couple of weeks. And uh, so that is 591. This is, uh, so Hudson AM844, the last one. Uh, 
bit of an unusual circumstance here as it involved a non-ferry command aircraft and a force landed in central Newfoundland in July of 42. And the aircraft was actually attached to RAF Coastal Command and was on its way to the, uh, to the United States at the time. Uh, but Ferry Command was tasked with salvaging the aircraft. And it took about eight months, uh, but uh, a runway was carved out in the bog using a bulldozer. And the aircraft was flown to Gander by Ferry Pilot Lowell Thompson. And in this photograph here, that's the, uh, the maintenance crew. And the gentleman you see in the center with the scarf around his neck is uh, Joe Gilmore, the, uh, the, head of, uh, the head of maintenance at Gander. And just for a bit of uh, interesting perspective here, a Google Earth picture. So of course in 1942, this was a very remote area, but you could still make out the remnants of the runway that was carved out in 1942. Uh, the only, uh, the Newfoundland Railway ran within, uh, I forget the exact distance, might have been five or six miles away. So they brought a bulldozer in on the railway and drove it overland. Uh, and they used a the bulldozer to carve out that runway. Most people driving by would not know, uh, naturally, the, very few people know about it. And the road that runs parallel to that uh, runway is the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, and on that same bog, you see the VOR DME, which is navigation, ironically enough, navigational equipment for nearby Deer Lake Airport. Of course, in 1942, there was, they were in the middle of nowhere. As I mentioned earlier, Group Tech Captain David Anderson, a bit of an intriguing character. And as I mentioned, he was the longest serving commanding officer. He served in the, uh, in the RAF in the First World War. And between the wars, he served in the RAF in Afghanistan and India. Uh, he then headed up the experimental test flights on the Hurricane and Spitfire fighter aircraft before their acceptance by the RAF. After the war started, he was transferred to the British Embassy in Washington. And then in uh, 1942, he arrived at Gander with his wife to uh, take command of the Ferry Command unit. Again, Joe Gilmore, the head of maintenance and standing next to uh, Fox Moth VOADE, uh, which along with the unit Norseman uh, were used, uh, was used for search and rescue, salvage operations and medevacs. And as mentioned, VOAD was the first aircraft to, uh, to land at Gander. It was owned by the Newfoundland government. When the RCAF took over the airport, uh, the Newfoundland government transferred uh, the aircraft to the RCAF, who who transferred the aircraft, who eventually transferred the aircraft over the ferry command. And both Gilmore and Anderson uh, were probably the most popular figures at the units and in nearby coastal communities. Because when called upon, they carried out numerous medevac flights, bringing people to hospital in Gander. Uh, or there were times when they actually would uh, deliver a doctor right to, uh, right to the patient's doorsteps, if need be. So on the topic of Group Captain Anderson, uh, this brings me to the last of the unit's wartime salvage operations, and it involves Hudson EW-896. The Hudson left Gander in uh, December of 1944 from Montreal, carrying none other than the commanding officer. Uh, the pilot had, had arranged to, uh, to bring his wife to Gander for Christmas, so he went to Montreal to pick up his wife. They left Montreal and flew to Maine in the US to pick up the commanding officer's son who was going to boarding school there. He was coming back to Gander for Christmas as well. So as they approached Gander, the, the weather closed in and they couldn't land. Uh, the pilot uh, decided that he, he didn't have sufficient fuel to get to the only available alternate goose bay. So he ended up having to force land in, uh, in southern southern part of the island, southern part of Newfoundland. Fortunately, there were no injuries and damage to the aircraft was minimal, but the uh, crew and passengers were stranded there for several days before they were spotted. The actual rescue mission took place on Christmas Day, 1944, and uh, Joe Gilmore made several flights in the unit Norseman to bring the, uh, the castaways back to Gander. So, that was in December of 44, and in January of 45, the following month, uh, that opens with uh, Commanding Officer Anderson being posted, to, posted out to Australia. But also in January, work begins on salvaging this particular 
Hudson bomber. And that's the photo was taken at the crash site. It took about six weeks, but the undercarriage was fitted with skis and the Hudson was flown to Gander again by uh, ferry pilot, pilot Lowell Thompson. And this is the Hudson with its skis attached in front of the ferry command hangar. Again, they didn't fool around. Sadly, however, in May of 1945, Joe Gilmore, their head of maintenance and signal supervisor, Frank Ratcliffe, were killed when the unit Norseman crashed in PEI. Uh, they were on the way to Montreal at the time the aircraft was supposed to be serviced in Montreal. But both of them were, uh, both of the men were returned to Gander and buried at the Gander Cemetery or the present day Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery. This brings me up to, so we're to the closure, closure of the unit. So we're, we're, the year is 1945, but aircraft continued to be ferried across the North Atlantic in significant numbers. In fact, in 1945, say from January 45 to VJ Day in August, the unit serviced about 800 deliveries. But when the war ended, uh, negotiations then began to return control of Gander to Newfoundland. As I mentioned, this was agreed to when the Canadians took it over in April that when the war was over, we would, we would negotiate, <laughs> negotiate things to return. And uh, so, so when the war ended, I think it was in January of 46, they sat down and, and negotiated the return of Gander. And ultimately Newfoundland, uh, resumed control of the airfield. Uh, the date that was set was the 31st of March of 1946. Of course, not just the Ferry Command Sector, Newfoundland resumed control of the entire air, airfield, the American side and the, and the Canadian side. And the uh, ferry, civilian Ferry Command personnel, they turned in their passes when the unit closed and they were flown to Montreal. Uh, some of them did stay on to work in Gander. They worked with the, the Newfoundland Department of Civil Aviation, which was now responsible for the, uh, for the airport. And the aforementioned Tom McGraw, for example, he, uh, the senior flying control officer, he returned to his old position as airport operations officer. And others took positions with the various airlines, which commenced commercial operations immediately when the war ended. I was just going to touch a little on the commercial aviation aspect of it because this is a transitionary period when Gander moves from a military base to a commercial operation and eventually earns that title, uh, the crossroads of the world. Uh, as I said, of course, Gander was, was built for the purpose of supporting regular trans transatlantic commercial operations. So when the war ended in 1945, these commercial carriers like uh, TWA and Pan Am, American Overseas, uh, BOAC, uh, KLM, Dutch Airlines, they were all anxious to get started. But the problem in 1945 when the war ended was that the airfield really lacked a suitable terminal and passenger accommodations to handle this anticipated level of commercial activity. As I mentioned, there was the administration building, but that just didn't cut it in terms of the accommodations. So late in 1945, uh, they made temporary arrangements to use some vacated US barracks for accommodations and a former US hangar as a terminal, uh, as a makeshift terminal. And this, uh, this was supposed to be temporary, but it seemed to drag down for, for such a long period of time that the commercial carriers were getting really annoyed uh, because aircraft that, commercial aircraft that were laid over for a short period of time, they were, they were uh, all these people were just sitting in the hangar. Apparently it was a, practically an unheated hangar. They were huddled in blankets. It was, it was not a good situation. And the, uh, Commercial carriers were complaining to the Newfoundland government about it. Uh, but in the meantime, so just before the RAF unit closed in March of 46, uh, the resident commanding officer, uh, and his name was Group Captain Bodding, he had prepared a report on airfield facilities, US RCAF RAF, with the intention of making recommendations to the government on their potential use for commercial aviation. And he identified the RAF side as the best for handling civilian passenger aircraft. And he suggested that the RAF barracks that were there could be converted over um, for accommodations for passengers and air crew. Other areas in the airfield on the RCAF and USAF side, he suggested that they, were, they could be converted over for accommodations for the staff of the various uh, commercial carriers that were coming to Gander. <clears throat> 
And ultimately, the Newfoundland government agreed, and the eight airlines who were involved in these negotiations, most of them I mentioned, BOAC and TCA and so on, they all agreed with his suggestion. Um, they signed a joint lease agreement, and they cost shared to have the, uh, the RAF sector converted over for commercial operations. So the, uh, the, barracks, the barracks building, as I in, recall an earlier photograph, there were three barracks buildings, A, B, and C. They were converted over to a hotel operation for passengers and quarters for flight crews and stewardesses, and also resident apartments. And the two former ferry command hangars, 21 and 22, uh, they basically comprised the terminal area. So hangar 22 in particular was converted to a passenger waiting area. Um, where there was airline ticket counters and the famous Big Dipper bar. And in the photograph here to the, to the right, you'll see the, the ticket counters. And to the left is, uh, I think what they call the novelty booth, just a, a place where you could buy souvenirs and magazines and so on. Uh, and the Big Dipper bar was, became a pretty famous bar there at the airport. And they say it was the only bar in Newfoundland that was open uh, at the time, open 24 seven. So the, uh, the Ferry Command side, or I should say the, uh, the, the terminal, the new terminal was officially opened in September of 1946 and used until the current terminal opened in 1959. And so essentially, uh, as one person put it, uh, a, an auditor at the time, that what they did with Hangar 22 is they constructed a terminal within the building. So basically it was a building built within a building, very odd arrangement, I suspect. So this sort of brings me to my conclusion here. And, uh, and I guess, as, as I mentioned, one of my objectives here was to determine, to determine the number of aircraft that were flown through Gander. So for the purpose of making this determination, I consulted a number of sources, uh, mainly uh, the RAF landing or watch log, which covers the period 1940 to the end of 1941, and a similar log that covers May of 43 to war's end. And I suspect May of 43, it started May of, and, and the log from May of 43 to the war's end is actually held here at the provincial archives. Uh, and I have a funny feeling that it was Tom McGraw who donated it to the archives. And, and I suspect to begin, I, I assume that it begins in May of 43 because that's when the joint uh, control center, US RAF control center opened. But still that left me with some gaps. Uh, and these were filled using mostly uh, the monthly reports filed by Sir Frederick Bowhill, the uh, Air Officer Commanding in Chief of Ferry Command, and the Unit Operations Record Book, which began in uh, around August of 42. Uh, there was a, there was a supposedly, from what I understand through the documents, that they did keep an operations record book before then, but its its location is, is unknown. Uh, and also the work of British aviation historian Peter Berry. He will compile a record of delivery flights over across the North Atlantic. So using all these sources, I came to the conclusion that about 4,000 uh, ferry command deliveries were made via Gander. So that's 40% roughly, I guess, of, uh, of all deliveries. And I don't include uh, any VIP flights or, or you know, uh, any sort of special flights or anything like that. These are strictly uh, ferry flights. And also uh, using the same sources and uh, American, uh, my USAF documents for Gander, I was able to, ter to determine that the, uh, this joint control unit, USRAF control unit that operated for two years from May uh, 43 to May of 45, that they handle about 7,500 uh, US and RAF ferry command uh, aircraft deliveries. So that's, uh, and that's it. I hope it made sense. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was really good, uh, Daryl. Thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, we'll turn it over to questions if there are any. Uh, just remember, you are muted, so don't try to talk before you unmute yourself. Sir Fred Anton killed on a flight out of Gander on a Hudson, or was it from somewhere else? I, I you you came in a bit broken, but you you were asking if if Banting was killed here. Yes. Yeah, Banting was on a uh, was on a Hudson. Uh, and he was killed in, in February of 1941. Just yeah, and, uh, uh, the aircraft crashed uh, uh, close to the town of Musgrave Harbor. And the, air, the aircraft is actually what the, what, there was so many people went into that crash site over the years and picked it to pieces, but the, the, 
the remnants of it was uh, was airlifted out back in the early 90s. Uh, the search and rescue squadron in Gander airlifted it out, and the uh, the wreckage is now on display in a in a municipal park in uh, Musgrave Harbour. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. There's a question in the chat here from Dave Gordon. Uh, he asks, did TCA Lancastrian mail aircraft use Gander? Uh, yeah, uh, they did. And uh, uh, yes, they did, I guess. And, and I know in my book, I do, I did, from, again, from the, uh, from the log books that I have, uh, the watch logs and landing logs from 43, I think I did go through and I believe I, I got a, a general idea of how many uh, flights were made through Gander exact number off the top of my head i'm not sure but uh, it is noted in my in my book but they yeah they did use gander and goose bay i'll jump in again are there are there um photographs of more we saw a lot of hudson's are mm. there photographs available of for example canadian built lancasters on the field and other types of aircraft that were ferried yeah uh, they're um uh, I've got, a, I know I do have a photograph, a, a photograph showing some, uh, one of the Canadian made Lancasters, one that actually, uh, I believe it, it uh, crashed uh, on, uh, on takeoff or landing, but I got, the, uh, there is a picture of one there being lifted by one of the big, the big crane in Gander. It was, uh, the Americans had this huge crane, uh, they nicknamed the Paul Bunyan. And I do have a picture of, uh, the, of the crane lifting this, uh, uh, lifting this aircraft. And speaking of the, the, the crane itself, I, I remember seeing the crane there in the uh, in the mid 80s at Gander, this crane that was used during the war, uh, you often see it in photographs lifting damaged aircraft and uh, unfortunately I understand that someone came and cut up the cut up the crane for scrap metal. But too bad but yeah no there are pictures of uh, uh, of Libs and Boston's and uh, B25s and so on yeah. Although I, I will say finding photographs of Gander during this period was a bit of a challenge. It's like, I think the, the base, uh, uh, the RCAF and the, uh, and the Americans had their own uh, base photographers, but I'm quite certain that the uh, Ferry Command didn't. So it always made it a bit more challenging to find photos. That's Daryl, Matt Yost here. Yes, sir. With all the uh, passengers going through and uh, all the air crew, how many people did it take at uh, any one time or were there at any one time normally uh, just to support all of those operations? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the, the ferry command side, I mean, there, and he, again, even the numbers of, of staff that worked there, I mean, at, at its peak, there might have been uh, four or five, uh, maybe four or 500 employees, uh, but uh, the exact number to uh, to to handle all this, I'm I'm not really sure. And and even a, in terms of accommodations, uh, even though the, when the ferry command saw it, there were barracks built there for accommodations, but I don't even think that was enough because they still use the um, the eastbound inn, and there was another inn built alongside called the Gander Inn. So uh, uh, so I don't think that the ferry command side had enough uh, enough com accommodations, but. Uh, yeah, the exact number of, uh, not really answering your question, I don't think, but uh, so I really don't know the exact number of people that would be required. Yeah, it's another one of those where if not kept in the records anywhere and trying to find that is, uh, you know, it would take yeah. all the work that you did just recording this material to find that one little tidbit. Oh, um, yeah. It's a it was pretty challenging, and then, and, and I guess another thing that sort of intrigued me, I guess, was the uh, was the fact that it was a bit of a challenge because even the uh, when I talked about the mishaps and like the the accident reports, as as, as you know, I mean the USAF crashes. Well, I can I can request those reports through Maxwell Air Force Base or other accident reports at RCAF. You can get them at the Library and Archives Canada, but most of the Ferry Command accident reports. Um, I, they, I don't know where they're to. No one knows where they're to. They're either destroyed or they're still uh, under lock and key. I do know when the Ferry Command unit closed out, they did form a, uh, before they closed, they formed a board, a board of survey, they call it, and they just went through all the different files. Uh, 
uh, at the unit. And uh, the documents show all these listings of files and what they decided to destroy, personnel records, everything, uh, documents on the piggery and all these really interesting oh, wow. things. They, they, they had a list, here's what we're destroying and here's what we're gonna send to the, uh, to the air ministry. And, uh, uh, but, but the accident reports for the Fury Command Every now and then, it seems that over in the UK, they, you know, the, uh, uh, I guess it's the, uh, the, the Air Ministry historical branch or whatever it may be there now. They, uh, they release, they release World War II accident reports, but uh, that, that was a bit of a challenge as well, right? Yeah, Eric, Eric Roscoe, Toronto. Many years ago, I used to live literally just outside Presswick Airport. So, is it fair to say that in that era that you refer to? most of those 4,000 or 7,500 aircraft actually passed through Presswick? Yeah, I would say the, the for sure the vast majority. I think there was some, uh, no doubt some went into, American ones went into, uh, you know, uh, Nuts Corner. And, uh, but I would, absolutely, I would say that the vast majority of those went through, went through, went to, you know, through Presswick, for sure. Yeah. Hey, I grew up uh, beside Presswick Airport too, and in the late 40s, it was the Strata Cruisers, the DC-60s, the Super Connies, and I guess they all had to land at Gander. There was none that could fly from Presswick to New York. No, that's right, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I know the, the level of commercial air traffic through Gander, and I, I'm trying to remember, but I did have one statistic there from 19... 46 and it was I don't know if it was one month they had uh, three or three or four hundred commercial flights went through there and this was in the immediately after the war so it was an extremely busy place to to, to the point where they were even concerned whether or not uh, the Newfoundland government could even you know provide the uh, the necessary uh, uh, staff and so on and, and to maintain the the terminal and the uh, and the runways and so on so but of course, it wasn't uh, after Confederation. It really wasn't the uh, provincial. Well, it wasn't the Newfoundland government's problem to worry about. I guess it was the federal government's then, right? Although it's an interesting, I think there, it's an interesting uh, would be an interesting study to look at Gander from say that period of 1946 to Confederation, that three-year period, and uh, I think that would be an interesting period to look at when when Newfoundland had complete control of its of its airport. I'll leave that for, to, to someone else to do. Well, that, that was an era in the era of, say, uh, DC sixes and strata cruisers and uh, constellations. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was not unusual to open a newspaper and find out that an aircraft had thrown a propeller in flight or even from time to time had shaken an engine right off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Daryl, John Crook in Salmon Arm. Um, what sort of navigation aids did they have as they started out across the Atlantic from Gander? Was it all celestial navigation or were there other aids? I, I think most I, I think most of it was celestial. Uh, but again, I you know, someone who might have more knowledge than I do on that particular matter can, can chime in there, but uh, I would imagine most of it was celestial. And uh, I don't know, yeah, I I don't have an exact answer there for you, unfortunately. But again, let's see if anybody else knows. Uh, Chime in by all means. Mm -hmm. I, I went to the little aviation museum in Gander with the uh, DC three tail sticking out the back, mm. and uh, I saw they had a tiger moth there, and we checked the registration on it. It was the last tiger moth to be built in Canada. Okay, yeah, uh, it's all yellow with no registration on it, but they have the papers for it. Yeah, and uh, that that came up recently, and uh, um, the. Mm. Uh, yeah, I did a little bit of research on it myself, and I and I did discover that that tiger moth was actually uh, used at Gander during the war as well by the um, I think it was the number nineteen service repair depot. Mm -hmm. uh, they did uh, so. I don't I don't think anybody realized that the uh, that the aircraft actually it was. I forget who bought it now. I should know, but uh, uh, it was in a barn here somewhere for years, and eventually uh, uh, someone. Uh, got convinced them to donate it to the museum in Gander. But when we looked a little further, we did realize that it did have a connection to Gander as well yep. during World War II. Oh, the de Havilland Moth Club in Britain was very interested to see about it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. 
So uh, Bill Clark here. I got a question about what, how, how bad uh, was the weather, or, or, or how much of a factor was it in the operations at uh, at Gander? Was it uh, one? Was it was it a, a, a good a choice as they could have made for location, or or were the uh, you know, I mean, how the how does those factors all kind of play into this? Yeah, and and I guess. Uh... They could have picked a better location, maybe in Florida or somewhere. But uh, in terms in terms of Newfoundland, I guess uh, one of the reason they, reasons they selected the site was because it was and, and like Botwood too, uh, the central part, the central part of Newfoundland tends to be less less fog for one for one thing. Uh, like even the east coast here, we have St. John's Torbay Airport, um, and people still question why in the world did they build it there because it's right next to the Atlantic Ocean and more often than not it's it's fogged in uh, but whether like I, I suppose if you're going to pick a place in in Newfoundland uh, in terms of, of, of weather and some consistently decent weather uh, certainly you know the central part um, there was now whether they would have been better served if they uh, had their flights departing from Halifax for example I I don't know if the weather would be said, certainly a little bit better, but weather was definitely a factor. I mean, the the, uh, the weather here, as you know, I mean, uh, our winters are long, even longer in Labrador, but uh, you know, our winters start early here and it was always a challenge with, uh, uh, you know, with icing. And uh, uh, so lots of times you see these uh, references and in, in, uh, in the in the diaries and the watch logs of aircraft that are just they they're they're icing up and they got to return back to gander so uh absolutely weather and, and i guess too at the time uh, you know i guess especially during world war ii and in the early early years of the ferry service that uh, there were a lot of unknowns and of course flying the atlantic in november december really had never been done before so it was a real learning curve but but for sure, weather, lots of times you see, you know, notations in the diaries of aircraft trying to get into Gander and then they got to divert to uh, find another base that's open in Newfoundland. So, you know, there's no doubt weather pay, played a huge, a huge role here. Um, but in terms of a, of a location in, in Eastern North America, uh, you're, this was probably your only option was Newfoundland. And then it was to try to find the best place in Newfoundland that was relatively fog free. So, Hence Gander, and it was a, I guess it was ideal because it was next to the railway as well. Uh, the, fly, the Gander Lake was was alongside, which was a useful alternate to Botwood. And uh, it was a large sort of semi-flat plateau, just woods and bogs. So it was a, it was determined to be a good location. It wasn't the only place, but uh, they had, uh, but it, it ended up being what they figured was the best.